Good morning, everyone. I'm Pete Rivet, and I'm going to talk about um, vocabulary management for enterprise knowledge graphs. Um, <coughs> Elisa gave me a bit of a, 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 an introduction in terms of um, the work where this has been happening, which is the, the OMG MBS capability. I'm going to be talking more about <coughs> the rationale for this and the problem we're trying to solve and the issues we're, we're trying to address with current um, RDF and ontology-based approaches. Am I supposed to do my own slide? Uh, oh, that's a good point. I guess so. Um, <laughs> okay. There you go. So I'm going to talk about the problems with um, terms in general, which is what we. And I'm going to. <coughs> in the next slide, I'm actually going to define my own terminology, take my own medicine. <coughs> and the big message I'm going to make, it, going to put across, is that terms are contextual. So I'm going to explain what that means and why that's important. And then explain why the current approaches used by RDF and OWL and SCOS don't really meet that need of contextual terms. And then describe the new approach we're moving towards with um, MVF and what, also what you can do um, right now. So firstly, some shared context um, for the presentation. So I'm talking about um, enterprise knowledge graphs here. So I'm not going to explain what enterprise knowledge graphs are from scratch. So I assume there's been enough our presentations about that. So what I'm going to be assuming is, is an enterprise knowledge graph environment where there's many different um, data sources, there's many different things that need to be integrated, there's many different um, populations within an enterprise uh, using the knowledge graph. So there's going to be a mixture of um, support for different communities. And then um, the communities are not only internal, they're, they're external as well, that people need to deal with information from suppliers, from government, from software vendors and whatever. And we're also assuming in an enterprise knowledge graph environment, we are making use of ontologies. So terminology I'm going to be using, so firstly is element. So element is, is something that you are managing the terms for. So it could be a class or property in an ontology. That's typically the case or, or some other resource. This is the, the thing that you're naming with the terms. And the term is, by term, I mean the label, the, the string that you're applying um, to those elements. And then vocabulary, I'm using synonymously with um, glossary. That's a, basically a collection of terms. So that's my own terminology, fairly informal. So what, what's, what's the problem we're trying to address here? <laughs> so in a nutshell, it's that we're, people in organizations are spending days on end just agreeing on the right term to use for an element. So typically some, something like use of customer. I, I, the, the guy from Intuit yesterday was saying um, that they've had lots of discussions and they, <coughs> they're right. And, and I disagree with him in that he said, I think he said at the end, like a loan is a loan and we've spent lots of time agreeing this is the definition of loan. <coughs> but I, I counter that and say, you do need one definition of, of a concept, the ontology class called loan, but you can have different people in different communities um, ha make, making use of their own term for it. So you don't force everyone to use the same language. You have one meaning which, uh, which um, many people can use different terms for. So that's the thing we're trying to address because you can't bind every, all these different uh, communities to, to use exactly the same term. Even if you manage to get your, your current group of um, knowledge graph users to agree to, to one term, You've got other external people. You've got um, external software vendors. They're bringing in software like SAP or whatever, which you can't get rid of. And they've got their own terminology um, for things. You can't replace that because it's in front of everyone's faces um, when they're using that software. You've got supply chain partners giving you data feeds. You've got um, different governments, either local or, or national governments. They require reports and they um, have laws and they use their own terms. Um, standards bodies like OMG or um, W3C have, have terms as well, um, as Elisa described. And even though within your enterprise you might agree a term, then um, other enterprises you might acquire um, would potentially have their own language and terms. 
So what we're trying to address is um, allowing people to use their own language, but have a, a, sh a shared meaning behind it. So how are people trying to currently, uh, or what, what are people currently doing with respect to terms? So I'm going <coughs> to talk about a couple of um, widely used standards, so RDF or RDFS, um, and this in includes OWL as well. Um, doesn't give you a lot out of the box. You've basically got um, built in to a standard, you've got RDFS label, which is the, the property you can apply to a class or a property or whatever to say, okay, this is a string saying, what, what is it called? <coughs> it does allow you to have many values for RDFS label. Um, so something can have many names, but there's no way to distinguish which name to use in, in which uh, context or for which purpose. The exception being, um, you can tag um, these labels with a natural language. So you can say this is an English name, and this is a French name, or even this is a, an English, a, a British English um, name for a thing. So, so that level of flexibility is there, but not much else besides in terms of the context. And so you, you're pretty much for practical purposes, stuck with one official label, and you can't say much about that label apart from this is the label, because the label itself is just a string, so it's breaking the rule about um, things not strings. So SCOS um, is a simple knowledge organization system, is another W3C standard, often used for, for taxonomies and vocabularies. And people, because of the paucity of RDF, people including FIBO, for example, that Elise mentioned earlier, use um, some of the SCOS um, properties because SCOS has got a bit more flexibility. In SCOS, you can say a, a pref label. So you can say, SCOS, I've got a preferred label for this class. Um, and that um, SCOS pref label is restricted to having one value per, per language, as opposed to IDFS label, where you can have any number of them. And you can also have many alt labels, alternative labels, or alternate labels, if you're in the US, um, that enables you to have many other synonyms for the, the same class. And you have uh, one or more SCOS definitions, um, which is the English um, description of the term as opposed to the, the ontology um, logic. So that goes, that's one step better than um, what RDF and OWL give you out of the box, but it still provides no context. You might have a pref label, but there's no way of saying who actually prefers it and in what, in what context, for what purpose. And there's no, the, the label itself is still a string. So it's still, it's again, breaking the things not strings rule. You can't say things about the label itself, like who agreed it and when. Um, who, who actually prefers it, even if you're stuck with one preferred one, it's useful to know who actually preferred it and why did they agree it? And where was it derived from? So better, but still pretty limited. There's actually an extent, a very simple extension for, for SCOS called SCOS XL, um, ex SCOS extension for labels. This um, makes SCOS label a class rather than a string. So it's one step further than um, the, the pure string approach. And it, it redefines, there's some clever redefinition which I won't go into, we, we effectively redefines the SCOS and press alt label properties to make use of this um, string. So this is um, just a little example I took from the AgroVoc um, ontology. So the, <laughs> I won't go into the detail of it, but um, what you can see at the um, right there is you've got the maze with a, a press label and an alt label. And those are not just strings, they're um, objects in their own right. And they're of type SCOS XL label. So it still doesn't give you a context. You're still saying uh, you've got a pref label, but again, it doesn't say who, who prefers it and in what context. You can say a bit more about the label and what it's derived from and so on, but it's still missing the context. And although there's a number of tools out there that support SCOS, not many of them actually support SCOS Excel, at least in my experience. <clears throat> so, so that's some issues with what we've currently got now. Um, Talk, I'll talk, talk more general, generally about the notion of, of context and, and naming and so on. So I'm sure everyone's heard this Shakespeare quote, a rose by any name with smell of sweet. Everyone you might use, in, in general, the general community would use the term rose, but um, if you're a botanist or whatever, you'd use the Latin term, rosa rubiginosa. 
and, and, and there's obviously other different natural language um, variants. And then there could be um, other specific types of, of rows. So going back into philosophy and linguistics, um, there's a, a fairly well-known pattern called the um, semiotic triangle. And this refers, um, and semiotics is a whole area of study by itself, and um, it's been used not only in linguistics, but in th things like film theory. Um, certain images or certain um, patterns have um, various meanings, like what does red mean in, in a movie? What, does, um, what do various sounds mean? So the idea is here you have something that you see, a symbol, which is typically, in, in, in our case, a, a name, <coughs> and that names something, that, that term refers to something, a, a class or like a, a count or whatever. <coughs> but the important thing is this is a dotted line at the bottom, and there's the, the thought or reference in the middle, which is the, the idea of context. So again, I'm, I'm pushing this idea that um, terms only really refer to things via some, some context. And I'm going to expand out um, what I mean by context and what sort of context um, we might be interested in. But this is just to refer back, this is a, a well-known um, linguistic um, pattern that we're, we're making use of. <coughs> so, again, the relationship between a, a term, the label and its meaning is, is mediated by context. For example, the same term can have different meanings in different contexts. So a, a word like account um, could, could mean all sorts of different things. It could be a, a, a bank account. It could be a, a story, an account of some event. Um, and likewise, a transaction could be um, a financial transaction. Or if you're a technical person, it could be a, a database transaction. So without that context and, and reference to some community, then um, the term in itself isn't that useful. Also, the same meaning can have different terms. So in the, in the US, what we refer, refer to as checking account is not called that at all in the UK, exactly the same sort of account. It's called a current account in the UK. So it's a many-to-many many, many, to many relationship between um, the thing being named, the element, and, and the term. And um, the biggest part of context, I'd argue, is the notion of community. And this is again drawn from linguistics, this idea of community. There's various variants of it within the um, linguistics community, such as speech community, discourse community, or community of practice. Um, we needn't, for the purposes here, go into the nuances of that, but there's a lot of theory behind this. So the natural language is part of um, the community. <coughs> and the definition I'm using for community is, is really a a group of people that share a set of, and, and this is a tuple of term plus meaning. Uh, I'll expand more on that later. So an example of a, a community might be Portuguese accountants. So th this is embeds the natural language aspect, and it also addresses their interests and, um, <coughs> and, and their community. Now, you can be as broad or as narrow as, as you need to, again, in terms of sharing that common set of term and meaning. So you could uh, have subsets of Portuguese speakers, for example, Brazil. In, in Brazil, I'm sure they have a different dialect of, of Portuguese than in Portugal itself. And it could be a narrower set of accountants. It could be cost accountants. So it's, it's, the idea is this is a flexible concept, and you define it for your needs, you define your specific communities. I wanted to say a bit about um, contrast between definition and um, meaning. So by definition, here I mean um, effectively a, a, a set of words to, to explain the term, to explain the meaning. So ideally, these definitions themselves, and this is what you, you get given in a dictionary or a glossary, and, and this needs to be aimed at the community. So. You're not giving the community just a, a term on its own. You say, okay, what does it mean in terms that that community will understand? Because if the term is specific to, to the community, that the definition needs to be specific to the community, in particular because you'd expect the definition to reuse other terms. And those terms need to be meaningful to that community, otherwise you, you've lost the whole point. And so the definition needs to tag along with the term, if you like. 
So you can't necessarily have the term um, in isolation for a community. It needs to be a pair of term and definition. And that, again, is um, an issue with um, the Scott's Excel approach. It's, it isolates the, the terms from, from the definitions. So meaning, in contrast, is the underlying sense of the term. So that's the referent, the thing on the right um, in, in the semiotic triangle. And this is what you'd express using your ontology um, in, in owl or in shackle or whatever. So this combination of um, that logic and, and some sort of neutral language. Now that ontology element, it, this is the thing identified, is, is identified by URI, as, as all ontologies and sch RDF schemas are. And that may be opaque or not. And you may choose some sort of neutral word to construct your URI, or you could just use a, a random number. Because, uh, and that's, for example, someone mentioned oboe earlier. Oboe is a, a very rich um, set of ontologies uh, in the medical space. And they, their ontology, your eyes don't use names at all. They just have um, fairly long, opaque um, integers that they use for their um, identifiers for their um, underlying meaning. And then they have a set of properties on those um, which constitute the logic. The point is that any word used in the ontology term doesn't really matter. It is the, um, the term itself aimed at the community that um, is being used to name it in a given context. Now, I'll show some examples of that later. So a vocabulary, then, is um, a grouping of terms and definitions. And it's the vocabulary that's um, associated with um, communities. So vocabulary, you can sort of view as a module, a re potentially reusable module of terms. So in theory, you could associate each individual term with a community, but that would get pretty unmanageable pretty quickly. So you can group your um, terms into um, vocabularies based on the communities that they're being aimed at, and also using good modularity principles of, of reuse. So you could have a, a general a vocabulary which has a general set of Portuguese accounting terms, and then a very where, where it differs, you could have a, a subset of that, sorry, an extension of that for Brazilian um, accounting terms. <laughs> and then that, that would effectively, in the same way our ontologies can import each other, the vocabulary would, would import the more general vocabulary. And the, the accounting vocabulary can import the, the, the more general English vocabulary that has some terms used by the general population. So and the other important thing, in the same way that Elisa talked about identifiers, she talked about identifiers not being inherent to an element, but an identifier referring to an element. So likewise, names and, and terms refer to the element rather than a, a term being inherent to the element, which is what you have with, with IDFS label or SCOS pref label. So again, it, it, it's, depending on the context, you get the... Um, you apply the name depending on the context. And I'll show you some example queries of how you can pull those together. So here's some examples which might be a bit hard to read. You can obviously look at the slides later. This is showing some, um, this is a, a UML diagram showing um, a, an example which we've got in the MVS standard. So we've got some, um, so the, the key thing here is to look at the terms. So here you've got a term for account management, a term called transaction, which is in the banking vocabulary. You've got uh, a term for credit and deposit and transaction. So here you've got one underlying me meaning, which is um, for a transaction element <laughs> and two different terms for it. The term credit is used um, for the in the banking vocabulary and the term deposit is used in the general English vocabulary. Because people talk about depositing uh, money into their, their account. They don't, don't generally, in English, talk about credit, crediting their account. But that's what the accountant, the, the bankers, would refer to. And likewise, you've got the notion of, of transaction here um, with, with a technical meaning. This is um, software engineers using transaction. And you've got a different, um, you've got the same word, transaction, used with a different meaning um, by the, uh, of the banking vocabulary. 
So this shows how you can effectively construct a, a knowledge graph of, of the terms and vocabularies themselves. And on the right here, you've also got the, the communities, banking, business community, the general population, and software engineers. I'm not going to go into in this, this in detail. This is showing what the, the, the meta model is, um, which will have a corresponding ontology for, for the MVF um, specification. <coughs> You've got um, things here you'd expect, like vocabulary entry and vocabulary and community. There's various other management things like status and so on. And MVF entry is uh, an abstraction um, for the, the thing you, that you're referring to that has the ontology meaning. So prior to MVF being complete and um, having software that direct, fully supports it, there's, there's, there's a lot you can do today, in fact. And this is just an example. It gets a bit technical. This is um, Sparkle I'm showing here. But <clears throat> given that in a knowledge graph, you can have um, multiple named graphs, which are effectively segments of, of information, which you can se selectively incorporate in a query, you, you can get um, a lot of this context applied through um, a notion of, of a, a workspace so here's a, um, a little sparkle query getting the, the, the term of a definition for an element. So the element would be effectively the input, and what this is doing is getting... <coughs> or, so this is... I, you could either provide a specific element as input to get its term and definition, or if you didn't um, provide a binding for element, this would give you all the terms and definitions in scope, like a glossary. The important thing is here is you, you select selectively um, querying vocab one and, and vocab two, and you can put any number of vocabularies in there, and that bounds your query, and that determines which named graphs are used to supply the, the value for the, the elements. And then the, what we're doing here is just um, to get everything in an ontology, for example, we're um, <coughs> instantiating element as a union of the IDFS classes and the IDFS properties that we have in scope, and then we're getting the vocabulary entry for these um, with a... <coughs> so this is going in the inverse direction from the, from the element to get the vocabulary entry for it, which is in scope. And then having got the vocabulary entry, we're getting the term and the definition. So this is like a, providing a complete glossary or definition lookup. And this will give different results by changing the, the from, the, the vocabularies that you're going to be um, querying. And likewise, um, this is an example of looking up an element. So starting with the term, um, looking up which element does this term refer to. So again, we're, we've got the vocabularies in scope that determine the, the, the context for that term. Then we're doing the inverse of these uh, the same properties. So we're starting from a term, going to the vocabulary entry that has the term, and then to the meaning, back to the element. So this is effectively going in the other direction using the inverse of the properties. So Elisa's already um, said a fair bit about MVF. Um, I don't think I need to say any more because I think she covered it all. And um, it will eventually be um, openly available and we're managing it in GitHub. We're also doing work in the Enterprise Knowledge Graph Foundation, which is um, a general foundation uh, I'm, on, I'm on the board for. We've, we've got a number of members, both corporate members and individual members. That is about um, popularizing um, enterprise knowledge graphs and, and helping people understand what it means to have a knowledge graph. And we're, we're de defining a maturity model with maturity level, levels and so on. So I'd encourage everyone interested in adoption of, the, of enterprise knowledge graphs, go to ekgf.org. And um, within the maturity model, we've got various, we've got four pillars, one more data oriented, one technology oriented, one business oriented, and one organization oriented. Within the data pillar, we've got um, various best practices and um, exemplars for applying vocabularies. So one of our, we've got a capability definition for vocabularies. And what we're working on now is um, examples of different levels of maturity for vocabularies. And we're taking a fun example, which is a, a, a movie use case. So this is all being use case driven. And we, we, we're publishing, like, uh, we're going to be publishing um, a vocabulary along the sort of lines I've been talking about at different levels of maturity. So you can see this is what a level one vocabulary is like, this is level two, and so on. So do come along. We've got, you, you, you don't have to join. You, there's free membership for individuals. There's paid membership for corporates. Um, 
you don't need, even need to be a member. You can just go along to this um, to the EKGF site and sign up. The vocabulary stuff we're doing is on uh, every Wednesday at um, noon uh, Pacific, and you're welcome to come along and follow along. So in summary, then, um, our, the current approaches people are using are pretty um, limited for really managing terms, because what they ignore is the important thing I've been hammer hammering, which is terms are contextual. <coughs> and there's um, a better approach. We're, we're both standardizing, and there's a short-term um, RDF-based approach using Sparkle that you can do to um, use it um, now, even without full MVF tools. And finally, just a little plug for Capacity Post, which is a company I, I joined um, a couple of months ago. So we're, we're a startup applying knowledge graphs in the um, insurance space. So we're actually going to be a user of semantic technology, providing knowledge-based insurance-focused products. And we're collaborating with other people in the insurance space, and we're also recruiting. So we're definitely interested in, in knowledge graph um, capabilities and Sparkle and so on. So you can click. I would find me, I'm, I'm leaving uh, sort of tw towards the end of the afternoon, try and grab me at lunch, or we're, um, you can go to capacitypost.com and join our team. All right. Thank you, Pete. We, well, we might be able to squeeze in one question. Um, we have an urgent question in the room. Lively discussion, <laughs> which you might want to check out. But we're actually you know, we're right down to about one minute. So... Um, I think rather than trying to squeeze the question in, let's just thank Pete for his talk. And uh, <laughs> right now, we're keeping you all from lunch. I'm sure that's why there's no questions. Oh, all right, thank you. There's one more. Sorry, there's one more presentation now. Oh, is there? Yes, there's half an hour ago so much. Oh, all right. Okay, we'll